great pleasure that I'm able to introduce Tom Jackson, who's come all the way from New York to address us. And uh, on behalf of the Placement Council, I really believe we're in for treat this evening. Tom is one of the nation's leading authorities on manpower and employment. And he is going to share with us some of his very, very practical knowledge that he's gained through work with corporations, the large blue chip corporations, with counselors, placement people, and also with top-notch executives. His most recent book that he's published, which you can get at the bookstore, by the way, is uh, 28 Days to a Better Job. And I'm sure that you all find this very, very interesting. And so I'd like to welcome Tom with a warm round of applause. Thank you. I want to just see how, can you hear me in the back? I may go for a while without the microphone, because I can move around a little bit. And on the other hand, I may start to lose my voice, I may use the microphone. <laughs> But we can't hear to say, hey, louder, I can't hear. Um, let me just get here for a minute and see who's here. I really want to acknowledge you all for coming here tonight. I know that there are probably 27 different things that you could be doing on campus tonight, and you chose to be here. And I, and I know what it takes to come to a place which is going to be talking about jobs. See, I know why like, you like to sit in the back of the room, close to the door. <laughs> You know, this time, kind of, what is it? Jobs, I mean, the direction people go in jobs, or the jobs are everything, they want to move over this way. I'm familiar with that, and I really want to acknowledge you for doing whatever you needed to do to get enough to come here and be here tonight for an hour or so. Um, I want to try to break down the, or break apart or blow up the normal relationship between a lecturer and the audience. I wanted to see that, see, usually what happens is there's a lecturer up here and you push the Tom Jackson talk button and Tom talks. See, then what you do is you push the whoever you are button and you start thinking about what you're going to do tomorrow and what you, how was your dinner and you know, how about that date you've got later on and all that stuff. And you have a really free space to just kind of be there with your private thoughts. And that's the usual way that it happens in lectures and then from time to time, what you'll do is tune in to see if you're missing anything or not. And if you're not, you'll go back to whatever it is you're, you know, you're planning that you're thinking about. So I really want to, I want to blow that apart if we can. And I want to do it by suggesting that you look at an alternate way to be here tonight. I want to suggest that you look at being here tonight out solely out of the value that you can get for you. So I want to invite you to see, well, what can I get out of this for me right now tonight? Not can the group get it, not what will everybody get it, what, you know, we heard Tom Jackson, so what. See if there's something that we can play out tonight that you can get some specific value in. One of the things you need to do to do that is be willing to keep coming back and notice the times when you go unconscious. See, one of the things that I've noticed over the years and over some 10,000 relationships with people who are in the job market is that at certain points, what will happen is that you will go unconscious. You will start to, you know, you'll want to leave. You will get bored. You won't want to look at that. You will say, that's not relevant to me. You will feel uncomfortable. All that stuff will come up. See, that's part of what happens is that that stuff comes up. Now, the game, is to see whether you're going to be willing to see through it. That is to say whether you're willing not to go unconscious, whether you're willing to keep bringing yourself back, whether you're willing to raise, the, you know, raise your hand if you've got a question or a disagreement, whether you're willing to share something if it's relevant, you know, whether you're willing to participate, and if you're willing just to stay here while we go through some of the spaces. See, most of us think that getting a job is lining up somewhere, not maybe figured, not actually, but figured to be lining up somewhere, and pretty soon we come to the head of the line, and they, you know, they hand out a three by five card, and we look at it and we go, oh no. You know, and or we say, oh terrific, I got the good one, you know, like that. <clears throat> See, it's like the jobs are like automatically part of the system. See, I want to let you know that they're not part of the system. See, all of you who've got it set up, you came to an incredible school, and you, you, know, you came from <clears throat> great education, and you did real well, 
and you're doing all this stuff, you know, that a job is not at the end of the rainbow, necessarily. They want to let you know that you make a difference. See, you can literally make a major difference in your life from here on out. I want you just to get that, that it's up to you and you will make a difference. <clears throat> it is not that there are just certain jobs and then you're going to get one of those jobs and all that stuff. You will literally, <clears throat> you will literally be able to make the difference in your job campaign and your work life. So I want to put in tonight, we're talking about guerrilla tactics. I want to start by laying out a couple of contexts so that you can begin to see that the purpose of my being here is not because the placement department wants me to be here, and the purpose of your being here is not because it's a good thing you should do. The purpose of my being here is to contribute to you to the degree to which I can so that what you get to do in your life aligns with your own purposes. I really want you to get that, that I'm here about you. I'm not here to get you a job. I'm not, I don't care if you get a job or don't. See, I literally don't care. You've got, you're all right with me just the way you are right now. See, I don't have a position about, you know what, what's your name? I don't have a position that Mary Ann is going to be better if she gets a job. I got, you know, like that, get it together, Mary Ann, get the job. I don't have a position. See, you're all terrific the way you are. What I have a position about is if Mary Ann is interested in getting a job, that her behavior is consistent with that. So that Mary Ann isn't pretending to get a job in reality playing out some other fantasy because, well, I'm never going to make it in the world or whatever other thing. I'm just, you know, making it up or I've never met her before, but it's like that. So I want you to know, I don't have a position about it. If any of you were worried that I was going to make you go get jobs, forget it. Relax. You don't have to get a job. It's okay. It's just that when I want you, when you're not out getting a job, I want you to be totally not getting a job. See, so that when you are interested in working in the work world, that you're totally able to do that. And out of the stuff that we'll cover tonight, you'll be able, I think, to experience the space of doing that. <clears throat> now, I want to start by laying in the purpose of this whole game. The purpose of the whole game of work, and it is a game, and you will see as we un unfold it, that you will see some of the game aspects of it. The purpose of the whole game playing it as a game is satisfaction. You see, I want you to know that the way we've set it up in the world these days is that it looks like there's work over here. And see, work is like over here. You know, you got to do that, and Mondays to Fridays, it's a drag, and you got to do that. And life is over here. And see, life starts after five on a weekend, right? Yeah. See, and I want you to know that's the way we seem to have set it up in the world now. And the degree to which you have allowed that to be that way is a ripple. See, the degree to which your life is over here, but your work is over here, you are ripping yourself off by about 10,000 days of your life, which is the average work life. So tonight, if you can achieve nothing else, I want to bring together the experience of living as work and the experience of work as living. If you're not making it in your work life, you're not making it in life, period. I do a lot of work with middle you know, managers and executives, people who have you know, maybe been out of school 10 or 12, 15 years, and we have workshops, and they come in there, and a lot of them are like basket cases. You know a few? Yeah, right. See, they come in there saying, you know, incredible schools, they went to MIT and Georgia Tech and Iowa, they went to all these schools, and they got all this money, and they, $30,000, $40,000 worth of education, and they put it all together, and they went out there, and it's 15 years later, and they're saying, I didn't think this was the way it was going to work out. How come I'm in a crummy job, and I hate to go to work, and I'm, you know, you know not getting it together, see? So I want to let you know that <coughs> I play in those fields. I see what happens, and I want to bring this information and realizations back here so that you can start to experience how you can make a difference. What this night is about is how you can make a difference in the quality of your life, and particularly as, as it relates to work, and contained in the context that work is life and that there's no difference. So that's the purpose of the night. That's what we're going to do here. Uh, I absolutely, see, I thought this was on. My, my throat started to feel good because I had the mic on. The mic is off. <laughs> this is like, isn't it incredible? <laughs> Mike is off and I'm thinking, I think my voice is carrying 
we ask the dummy mic to carry around for that. Anyway, uh, so the context is satisfaction. The position to play from tonight, if you're willing, is to see what value you can get out of it. And the game is the game of work and how to use it as a, as a vehicle to come from who you are into the work world in a way that produces satisfaction. Now, <clears throat> can I get this mic on? Because I know I will need it. So who's ever audio, is it, are you an AV? Who's the audio visual? All right, well, let's, let's, let's get that handled and then we'll see if you want. Um, what, we're, what, what I'm going to cover, I'm going to wait until the mic gets on. I'm going to do a process in a minute that I would like to have the mic available for. But what we're going to cover tonight is a few contextual things. We're going to cover stuff that you've never heard of before in relationship to work, probably. Some context, some looking at it underneath it, not just uh, how to do it. You see, well, the position that most of you have played in relationship to work has been that somebody out there wants me to do something. And guess what? When somebody out there wants you to do something, what do you do? Resist, right? Isn't that natural? You know, they want me to do this, come and get me, you know, like that. And that's the position that most people play about work, is that they want me to do it, and I'm not going to do it. So tonight we're going to look at some of those contexts. We're going to look at communications and give you some input in a new way of looking at communications. And we're going to deal with some very, very specific nuts and bolts tactics of how to get jobs that aren't advertised, how to put together a resume, how to take interviews, how to control the interview, how to negotiate salary so that you can up your salary, lifetime salary expectancy by seventy-five or hundred thousand dollars throughout your lifetime, and a few things like that. Okay, so what I want to start with is I want to do a process. I think I'll just go on even for my kids and one. And what I will need, Joanne, I'll need somebody at the door not to let anybody in during just during this process. Do you mind doing that? What this is going to be is an eyes closed process. So what that means is that when you have your eyes, because I don't want people coming in saying, hey, is this the sex education <laughs> film tonight? Or whatever. <laughs> you know, and everybody puts it like that. Um, if, you have, if you have a pencil, take it out and put it on, under your chair. I want it to be available after the process. Is it, wait, who doesn't have a pencil? Was, raise your hand if you don't have a pencil and see if somebody around you can lend you an extra pencil. You, you're going to want one after this process, I think. So see if you can handle that intramurally there. Okay, if you don't have a pencil, paper like that, raise your hand and see if somebody around you can help. Somebody in the back have a pencil, a piece of paper, a pen like that. Okay, take everything off your lap, put everything under your seat. This is going to be about a five minute process with your eyes closed. Now, the only, the only rule to follow in this process is that while the process is going on, there's no talking. Obviously, if everybody's got their eyes closed and you say something or like that, then you, you know, everybody gets it and it interferes with the space of everybody. So during this process, there's no talking. Um, when we, we're going to look at certain things about things, and when, we, when I ask you to look at certain things, then just literally look at what you see. Don't try to force to see something else. Just see whatever you see. Just relax. It's not, you know, it's a really terrific trip. Okay, so uncross. Notice that you're holding hands with yourself now. Just un uncross your arms and legs. Sit back in your chair. Great. Okay, no, no talking until the end of the process. Thank you. Uh, just let your eyes close. Just, just let yourself go a little bit. Just let your eyes close. Stop holding hands with yourself, uncross your hands. Notice that you're going to want to do that. And just try to be open, be there in an open position. Great. Now get a sense of what it's like just being there in the chair. Thank you. Now expand your space or consciousness to include the person or persons next to you. And if your eyes come open, just let them close again. It's all right.
Good, thank you. Now expand your space or consciousness to include all of the people in this room. Fabulous. Now expand your space or consciousness to include the entire room itself. The walls, floor, ceiling, lights, drapes. Just get a picture of the entire room. Notice if you hear any sounds that you weren't aware of before. Good, thank you. Now focus your consciousness like a spotlight and just let it run through your body. And notice if there are any tensions, any tight spots. You know, just go through your body, your legs, your lower back. Just notice what's going on in your body. Notice where you have tension build up. Good, now observe your breathing. Great, thank you. Now, mentally step away from yourself and kind of look back at yourself sitting there in the chair and just get a picture of what you look like sitting there in the chair. Just check your posture, and just see how you're dressed and just kind of notice you sitting there in the chair. Great, now notice yourself just getting up out of the chair, going out to the aisles on either side Slowly walking to the back of the room. Great, to see yourself walking to the back of the room and then out of the auditorium door and out to the little lounge area that's out there and then just continue on and all the way out to the steps that are out in front. And then notice you're going down the steps and then to the doors to the outside of the building. And then just notice yourself going outside the doors and just being outside the building. And it's a beautiful, clear, blue sky day, crystal clear, cool air, autumn air, autumn smells. You just get a sense of what it's like being out there by yourself. Just kind of let all your senses play. Good. Now notice over there to the far side of where you're looking, there's a little red and blue helicopter. Crowd of four or five people around it. Big bubble plastic canopy up front. Very smooth metal. Walk over to the helicopter and just kind of look at it. Run your hands along the smooth metallic surfaces and over the bubble plexiglass dome in the front. Good. And look inside and notice that there's a pilot inside. And the pilot's beckoning for you to come around to the other side, reached over and opened the door from the inside, and invited you to step inside the helicopter. So just climb up and step inside the helicopter. Close and latch the door behind you. Reach down and fasten your seat belt, cinch it up tight. And then just look around the cockpit of the helicopter. Notice the instruments, the engine controls, the flight control stick, Look through the plastic canopy. You can see the people still out there, cars and trees. Just notice all that and then see that the pilot is reaching down, turning on the ignition. The rotors are starting to turn. The engine's turning over. The rotors are now turning, kicking up a little bit of dust. Notice that the helicopter's moving up off the ground about a foot, foot and a half, kind of stabilizing there. Great, now more power is being added. The people are scurrying out of the way. Helicopters moving up maybe to 25 feet. You can look down and see cars and trees, activity, people moving around. Now up to maybe 75 feet. You can begin to see the tops of some of the buildings. And move even higher now. Look over the entire campus. Beautiful autumn coloring the leaves, lakes and streams, rolling hills. Just notice all the entire surrounding area. You can see all the way to Des Moines. Good, move even higher and faster now. Just move up to a much higher altitude and just move towards the Great Lakes. 
See all the Great Lakes in Chicago, Milwaukee, see over to Detroit, Erie, Pennsylvania, just see all of the flat plain states, move over towards the northeast, fly down up along the coast of New England, across Canada, down the main coast, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Vermont, you can see the Atlantic Ocean, all the way down towards New York, see the island of Manhattan, the Verrazano Bridge, and the Brooklyn Bridge, and all the other bridges there. Crystal clear, beautiful blue sky day, heading further south now, down to Philadelphia and Washington and Delaware River. Just take it all in, just visualize it all, every detail. Know that you have the power to see all of it. Move further down the southern coastline, down the southeastern states, Carolinas, Virginia, Mississippi, Alabama, down to Florida. See the beautiful Gulf Stream coming through along the coastal line of Florida. Blue, clear water, the Bahamas off in the distance. You can see now Miami and Fort Lauderdale. Great, now sweep back up to the Gulf of Mexico. Good, see New Orleans, Houston, state of Texas. <clears throat> Moving further out now through the western states, Arizona, Nevada. See all the way up to the Rocky Mountains. Just take it all in and just look at this panoramic view that's underneath you. Moving more fast now, moving out towards California, Baja, California, Mexico, the Pacific Ocean, San Diego, ships, Navy ships coming into the harbor in San Diego, all the way up the coastline full of houses and highways up to Los Angeles. Great, then out from Los Angeles, you see the Rocky Hills and then more desert, and then all the way up the coastline of California, San Francisco, Bay Bridge, Golden Gate Bridge, Great, moving up through the Red, Redwood Forest, all the way up the coastline to Oregon, Washington, see Canada up there. See all of it now, just expand your entire view of the United States, just look down over all of it from a magnificent perch way up in the sky. Fabulous. Now select a place that you would like to live and work in, and instruct the pilot to take you there, and just take whatever comes up. Good, and just instruct the pilot to take you there to that new destination, moving very quickly, passing the ribbons of highways, factories, schools, hospitals, businesses, skyscrapers, all of it underneath you as you go to your destination, farms. Just see all of it, you're heading towards your destination. Great, you're moving closer into your destination, come down to a lower altitude. Great, as you approach your destination, you come down to a lower altitude and now begin to look at the streets, the cars in the streets, the people going about their activities. Just notice all the things that are going on as you approach your destination town. Good, now select a specific place, a building, or a location that you would like to work in. Fine, and project yourself inside that. <clears throat> Good, now you're inside an ideal working environment for yourself, a place that you'd like to work in. Just look around. Notice how the people are dressed. Notice how you're dressed. Notice what they're doing, how they're communicating. See what tools you're working with. Just notice around you what's going on in this ideal work environment. See if you can notice what responsibilities you have, or who you report to, who reports to you. Just look around and notice all of these things. Great, now take another look around this ideal working environment. Just sense what you're doing there, see what expression you have on your face, how you're holding your body, how you feel about being there, what your fears are. Good, just look at all that and now start to say goodbye to the other people there, if there are other people there. Just bid them all goodbye. <clears throat> Great, now go out the door and then back out and down to the street. Notice that the helicopter's waiting for you there. Good, run up to the helicopter, open the door, jump in the helicopter, slam the door, bolt on the seat belt, give the pilot the signal, pilot's taking off, high speed takeoff, moving up to 200, 300, 1,000 feet, way up there, heading back to campus. 
Moving on the double, just take a last look around you at this terrain underneath you. Good, heading back to campus. Just find a place to land near the auditorium, near the building. Good, you've located a place to land. You pointed out to the pilot. The pilot's bringing you down. People are moving out of the way, looking up as the helicopter comes down. Great, the helicopter's now touching down on the ground. A little bit of dust kicking up from the rotors. Say goodbye to the pilot. Good, reach down under your seatbelt, unlatch the door. Jump out, stay low because that rotors are still turning on over your head. Great, slam the door behind you. Crouch down and run over towards the auditorium building. Good, come in the front door, up the stairs. Great, through the little lobbies and the ante rooms, back to the room, into the back of the auditorium, and open the door so slowly coming into the auditorium. And notice as you walk in that there are a lot of people sitting here with their eyes closed. Kind of look around, locate where your row was. Identify your row, move up to your row, be very cautious moving back in so you don't disturb anybody. Great, come back down. Good, sit down in your seat. Just be in your seat for a minute and get a sense of what it's like being in this auditorium. Good, in a minute I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. But before I do, I want to posit a question. When you get the answer to this question, then I want you to open your eyes and write it down. And the question is this. What is an, an ideal job that you would like to see yourself in five years from now? Say it again. What is, it, what is an ideal job that you would like to see yourself in five years from now? Now, when you get the answer to that question, you can open your eyes and write it down. But no talking just yet. There's a couple more steps in the process. So you're looking for the answer to the question, what is an ideal job that you would like to be in five years from now? It doesn't have to be the ideal, and take whatever comes up. <clears throat> and, if, and if you can't come across anything, just take something that you could get if you did come across something. And just write something down. It's important that you write this down. So without talking, I want you to write down what is an ideal job that you would like to be in five years from now. Okay, notice if you have any resistance to this process, if you're thinking, well, I don't know, well, I don't need to know, and just notice if all that stuff is coming up. If it is, just acknowledge that it's there and see if you're willing to write something down anyway. If you don't have a pencil, just try to cement something in your memory. The point is to try to make something real. You're not stuck with it, you can change it, but try to get something real down there. Okay, great. Under that, what I'd like you to do is to write down what would be a job or a position that you would need to be in three years from now in order to be on target towards your five-year ideal? So under your five-year ideal, write down what would be an intermediate step for you towards that ideal. What would be a three-year way, way post towards that job? Again, if you don't know or you're not sure, that's cool. That's just the way it should be. Just write that. Just write something down. Just guess. Good. Thank you. Now, the last thing to write down is this. What would be an initial, an entry level, or a next step job if you're already working? to start the process leading to the, to the three-year midpoint and therefore leading to the five-year ideal. Because what would be a starting entry point into that ladder? Just write something down. If you're not sure, just take a guess at it. So what you've got now are three things. You've got a five-year <coughs> ideal job you would, wouldn't mind having. You've got a midpoint of a place you need to be three years from now in order to be on target to that. And you have an entry point. So let's take about five, 10 seconds to finish up that list. And if you don't have a pencil, and I know a couple of you don't, just try to cement that specifically in your mind as if you wrote it in your mind. In other words, don't keep rethinking it. Just write it in there. OK, good. The next step in the process is I want you to turn to your right or left and get a partner. Just establish eye contact with somebody. Okay, if you don't have a partner, if you're in an odd number, just raise your hand.
turn around and find somebody else and raise hand. Raise your hand, young partner. Over here. So turn around and find somebody else. People with raised hands, find somebody else with a raised hand. Raise your hands, okay. Over here, you two. Come up to the edge of the seat for a second. Yeah, come out to the edge. Right over there. Okay? Good. Can we move back here? If you just for a second, you know, just for the process. Thank you. Anything, anybody else that has a partner? Just raise your hand. Somebody's finding out. I have to count the number of people in this room, and there's got to be one person, odd person. <laughs> okay, one by the back. Okay, do you have that, Joanne? You, you don't have to say that anymore. You two can go together. Okay. Anybody else, any last minute holdouts that are not going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I wanted to do that process. You're not going to know what I'm going to say to do, do you? Okay. What I want you to do is to take um, two or three minutes and communicate to your partner what your five-year target turned out to be. Just tell them what it, what it was, and then communicate to them what you saw as the entry-level position. And also, communicate, by the way, listen to this, get this, communicate any resistance that you had. Like if you felt a little anger, or you said, why do I hear about job targets for? I wanted to be here about resumes. Or if there were any considerations that came up in the process, identify what they were. See, because that's the context in which you hold the selection. So communicate that as well. It'll take like three minutes. Ready, begin. One back. Great, thank you. Now, the purpose of that process, in order, you know, one to have anybody have a really terrific trip, <laughs> anybody unexpected. I did this thing in Connecticut, and I had the dean of students was there, and he didn't you know, but he went through the process anyway, and where he ended up was incredible, because he said afterwards, he said, that's what I've always wanted to do. He ended up in a little thatched hut in the Bahamas selling hot dogs for tourists. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I thought I was going to get some executive position like at IBM or Control Dad or something, and he just, you know, the mind just took over and went, Shh. there he was on the beach, you know, putting mustard on the hot dogs and stuff. <laughs> so anyway, the, the, one of the things I want you to get out of that process is that Work isn't something that you go get. See, we all have it set up that work is like a job title. It's called being an equestrian manager, or it's called being, being a cost account, or it's called being a, you know electrical engineer. And that's not what it is at all. See, what it is is a space. See, what, when you see yourself, when you actually end up working, what you, don't, you forget what your job title is frequently. And what you do is you're in an environment. See, it's actually something that you do. It's actually a doing this thing. It has physicality to it. It has emotions to it. It has game playing to it. It has other people to it. It has communication. It has clothing. It has, you know, all the harassment, all the stuff in our life is there at work. It's not like some abstract three by five card in the sky that is our job. See, and I want you just to start to get a picture of that. You know, I want you to. Be aware that the degree to which you can actually go out in the field and visit employers. See, the, the, I know there are some of you in here who are doing that in one of the elective programs you've got. I know that the degree to which you can actually go out and experience what the working environment will be is incredibly, moves you incredibly further along because you can say, oh, oh, that's what it's like. Forget it, I don't want that. I'm switching. <laughs> you can literally get it. You can start to see the playground and you get off of it that work is something you have to take a test to get. So you're all into like taking tests. No, your job is a, is a playing field. And we'll get to more of that later on. But a job is actually a space in which things happen. And it's not what, something you get. It's not like go get a job. It's actually what you do. It's actually like, like uh, football is not a game to play. It's a thing to do. And it's called football. 
but you don't football, you run around, you, you, know, you do all the things, and we call it football, but that doesn't describe it, obviously. Say football doesn't describe the experience of it. The same thing about job titles. The title is nothing to do with the experience. You know, and it's related because it's the key in, but what the experience is, is you, all 152 pounds of you, sitting there in your new Gucci, da 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 da, doing your thing, you know, that's what your work is, you know, I mean, it's like it's there, you know, from nine to five. See, another thing I want to touch on briefly, we have, by the way, this workshop, this lecture, we're going to cover like 12, one of the things I do is a 12 hour workshop, and we're going to cover all that in about an hour and a half, so I'm going to move very, very quickly. Oh, and I want to tell you that there's a 10 page outline for this program copies of which will be available at the various placement offices throughout the, college, the university, at the various college placement offices. So you don't have to write down a number of the things. I'll tell you very specifically if something's not on the outline. So if you want to get a copy of the outline, it will save you from some of the note-taking. Um, see, I got my first, I used to be a Navy test pilot. And so right after I, so that qualified me to become a personnel manager, because that's what I became, right? <laughs> The bizarre logic of it all, I'll tell you. <laughs> anyway, I got to be a personnel manager. And when I got there, you know, I said, okay, I'll do this job. You know, I've got wings in an engine, I'll fly it, you know. You know, I got there to be personnel manager, and the first thing I decided to do was to say, well, what am I gonna do now? Where I am, you know, I'm no longer doing that. What do you, what do, you do now? What's the game? And I thought the game was to become a success. So I said, aha, what I want to do is become a success. So I said, great, that's what everybody told me you ought to do is go become a success. So I said, well, how do you get to be a success? So I know that I started a job with making like $8,500 a year some years ago. So I said, well, the way you get to be a success is easy. Make $12,000 a year. I think that's $1,000 a month. That's, I think that's a lot of money. So get to make $12,000 a year. So I went out and I bought a three-piece suit, you know, and I shined my shoes and I got in there early and I, you know, did all the things that I needed to do. And a year, 12, 13 months later, I was up to $12,000 a year. You know, and I rushed home, I opened my pay envelope and I deposited it and did all that stuff. And Monday morning, forget it. No difference. You know, I didn't want to go to work. You know, it was still Monday morning and I didn't want to go. You know, so I got up and I went to work. And I started looking at that and I decided that, well, I know what the problem was, is that with $12,000 a year, they take all the taxes out, you don't have $12,000 left. But if you made 15, then by the time they took the taxes out, you would have $12,000 to spend. So I went after that, you know, and da, 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 the story continues, you know, and by about 15 months later, or 16, or 17 months later, I was up to $15,000 a year. And yes, there was that much left over. And when it's all over, by the time I had paid for the new NGTC that I got, that was down to about $27.50 a week I had to spend for me. <laughs> You know, that's like, oh, well, okay, so now what I gotta do is I gotta break the $27.50 a week barrier. Well, I went from 15, and then I knew that there was gonna be 20, and I knew if you made 20, that would be it, and then there's 25, and at every stage, I knew that the next stage, that that would totally satisfy, I promised God, if I got that, I would, you know, then I'd ask for a dime, everybody, anybody experienced this before? I wouldn't ask for a dime more, you know, I got that, I asked for another 10,000. <laughs> And it went on and on and on and on and on. And I was, you know, I was reasonably aggressive in my earlier days, and I was able to make a considerable amount of money and, uh, and got that, all that other stuff together. And what I finally decided was that at every level, there was nothing satisfying. And I had this realization. And the realization was that what success was about was calling something over there better than over here. See, going after see, success was this promise that was never kept. It was always out there somewhere. It's like when you started as a freshman, you knew your life would work when you got to be a junior. Uh-uh, didn't work, did it? <laughs> now you know when you get out of school, your life is going to work. Uh-uh, no difference. See, success is like over there. Now, what is it going to say about us if we always are saying that over there is where we want to get? Anybody? What if over there is where I want to go? What does it say about where I am right now? It's no good, right. It's got to be. I don't know if over there is the way it's going to be really good. Over here, I'm constantly drowning. It's no good over here. 
See, and success is a game that people play in which there is no inherent satisfaction. See, I want you to know that all of you know, all of you have this idea that if you made that much money, your life would work, you'd be a total success, and you'd never have to worry about another thing. See, I don't care what it is. If it's a million dollars, some of you, all of you have got a figure. And I'll tell you, if it's a million dollars that, that I can tell you for sure that if there's anybody in here who's already made a million dollars, they would say, no, it's 10 million. The million's not enough. There's never enough when you're playing the game that satisfaction is outside of you. So I really want you to know that the game that people play and rip themselves off about for year upon year upon year upon year upon year upon year is it is better over there than it is here. That's why people go out and take a crummy job that has no satisfaction in it and will stay there for six years hoping to become branch manager. See, and then they finally make it to branch manager and they have the biggest hangover you've ever seen because they know that now that they've got there, they didn't want it anyway. Now they've got to go to be corporate, you know, the, the group vice president or something. Now, I wanted to, but what really works, I'm just trying to get this, what really works is having a job that works for you right now. See, so that the satisfaction is right now. See, by the way, that's the only time there is right now. See, there is only right now, by the way. I don't have to go into that, so it would take us about two or a day and a half to get through that. But there is only right now, and satisfaction can only come in present tense right now. And what real success in a job is, and believe me, you will see the people who are really making it in the world have done this. You know, the Harold Janines or the Mick Jaggers or the people who are just, you know, who exult in what they do have gotten that the real success is having a job that get, supports you doing what you want to do anyway. Can you imagine getting paid for what you would do, what you would be willing to pay for it to do? See, that really having a job that allows you to play with the tools you want to play with, to be with the people you want to be with, to go to the places you want to go to, to have the communications you want to have, to literally use the work experience to satisfy you now. Every moment of now, every successive moment of now, bango, 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 just get off on it, and have your success. See, I'm totally in favor of everybody succeeding. And I just want you to know that there's no inherent satisfaction in it. So if what you're doing is racing out to grab your job, to, you know, to make it way out there, that may be, and listen, there'll be about one out of, two out of ten of you in here who will not do this. See, that's just the way it's going to be. You know, eight out of ten of you will still fall into this trap. It's, it's seductive. The whole system is set up to suck you in. You know, th this soap is better than that soap. This car is better than that car. You know, you'll get, you know, get laid more if you do this. You know, you'll get this. I mean, it's just more and more and more and more. Always over there is better than over here. I, I just bring you a report back times thousands and thousands of hours logged in playing that game that there's no inherent satisfaction in it. That doesn't mean don't play it. Just play it in a mode in which you're getting off and what you're doing it when you're doing it right now. Okay, the job search starts. And where the job search starts is right here. Do not go for a, out for a job until you're clear about what it is you want to go for. See, a lot of people go racing into interviews and they don't even consider why the hell they're interviewing. But they're, you know, that's the next thing to do is to have an interview. Start here. You will, see, I will let you know tonight the things you need to do in order to actually create the kind of job that you want starting over here. And that may be the exact new job somebody's interviewing campus for. But go into it starting over here so you know that that's what you want to do. Don't go into it saying, well, gee, um, you know, I mean, it's a job, I might as well take it, right? Huh? You know, all your friends say, yeah, you might as well take it. See, your friends don't care, you know. Off you go. You know, see, don't, just look carefully when you do that. See, because that's, a, see, you're paying with big chips. You're playing with three-year increments, you know? Okay, well, I'll put three, you know. I'll, I'll be there for only six months, and then I'll leave. Six years later, you know, you've narrowed it down to three months, you know? So I just want to bring you that information to watch out. The job search starts over here. And I'm going to give you a process in a minute. It's not an eyes closed process over there. There's a tactic, actually. And the tactic is reprinted in the outline, so I'm going to cover it very, very quickly. So you don't have to take notes, it's all reprinted. 
And this is a tactic for identifying job targets out of who you are. This process handles five variables you cannot handle in your mind and will enable you always to come from who you are into the work world in a way that produces a job target that will give you satisfaction. I'm going to cover it very briefly. As I said, it's, it's in the outline. Step one, list 25 things that you like to do. Don't stop until you fill the list. That I said, don't stop. I mean, you stop, but don't go on to step two. Just continue on step one until you've listed 25 things you like to do. Work-related, not work-related, hedonistic, sexual, I mean, anything. Just put it all down. Just liberate your thoughts. Don't connect it to work yet. Okay, step two, and you, by the way, get stuck. You'll get stuck at around 12. <laughs> You'll say, what, that's it? You know, I'm 19, 21 years old, and I've got 12 things I like to do in the world. Far out. You know, and then you'll go, oh, yeah, I like sailboating. Yeah, OK, I'll put that on. And you open up a whole new list. OK, step two, list 25 problems that you can solve. Another way of saying it is list 25 results that you can produce. <coughs> See, driving the, a car from here to San Diego is a result, long distance driving. Okay, it's a result you can produce. Put it down. Don't evaluate whether that's good enough to go on your list or not. You know? Great, you like to crochet? Put it down. You like to edit? Put it down. You like to take pictures? Put it down. You know, or, excuse me, I'm back into this. If you can produce results taking and doing editing, blah, blah, blah. you get what I'm saying. By the way, the I likes and the I can, the things you like to do and the things you can do, the products you can solve will overlap. That's the way it should be. Separate lists, however, do not stop until you've got 25 on both lists, on each list. Step three, select the top five from each list. See, now, aha, uh -huh, you say, oh, I can go right to the top five because I know what they are. Wrong. You have to go through the process that liberates things that you're not used to looking at. Select the top five of each. Okay, now you, in the outline, there's a picture of the grid that I'm going to talk about. So don't worry about it not being clear in the written instructions on the slide. You create a grid, five, you know, cross hatches, like this, five lines vertical, five horizontal. On the five horizontal lines, you list the five things that you like to do. Everybody with me? Five going across. You have, you have intersecting lines coming down. You list the five things, five skills and five interests, and they intersect. You don't, you don't understand it, raise your hand. OK, good. So we now have a grid constructed of cross hatch lines of five on one side, five across the top, skills on one side, interests across the top. And we have a potential number of 25 intersections. Everybody with me? Great. 25 intersections so that your skill in writing could intersect with your interest in travel, plus four other interests that your skill in writing could intersect with. OK, so now you are looking at a grid, a skill interest cross index that has interests and skills in a grid. Next step is to select 10 of those potential intersections like the skill of writing and interest in travel is one. Just number 10 of them, 10 out of 25. 10 that you feel you, could, you wouldn't mind trying to put together, one component skill, one of interest, in a way to create some job. So you list 10 intersections. Now, stay with me. It's a little, it's a little heavier. You get more cops. You are adding variables. This, is, this, this is process is easier to do than it is to explain. Because as you're explaining, we're trying to hold the first three variables in. Okay. Next step is to, for each, for each intersection, invent three jobs. Now, when I say invent three jobs, you can look out in the world and say, let's see, my skill of writing, my interest in travel, uh -huh, I could write travel brochures, I could write airline magazines, I could be a foreign editor, I could be, work for an international corporation, you know, whatever it is, you start to invent jobs that just include that component skill, that component of interest. Without regard to the job market, we are not into the job market yet. This is without regard to anything you know about being out there, whatever. This is just your own exercise with you. You see, and what's going to come up is this. You're going to keep coming up and say, well, why should I do this? There are no jobs doing that. Great. Put it down anyway. See, you are the worst, you are your own worst enemy as it comes to the work world. And the whole point of this is to show you how you can make a difference. <laughs> Okay, now you've got three jobs for each. So you now have 30 listings. 
You have now listed 30 possible targets. Here comes the next variable. Go down the list and select all the jobs that would give you the most satisfaction personally and put an A in front of those jobs. And then go down the list and pick out the ones that would have the least satisfaction and put a C in front of those jobs. And then the ones that are left over, put a B. So you have A, B, C coding of the list of 30, A for maximum satisfaction, C for minimum satisfaction. Stay with it. Good. Now you have all your A's, you have a list of, you have A's, you have B's, and you have C's all mixed up. Pick out your A's. You've got five A's. Now this, I know this process is going to drive you crazy. Stay with it. Because you're dealing with your life and the variables and all that stuff, and what you wanted to do is to have me hand out jobs. So stay with it. I know that it's going to bring it up. You're going to have to fight to stay conscious of this. A, B, C of satisfaction. Take all of the A's and rank them, 1 to 10, or 1 to 5, or 1 to 6, no matter how many A's you have, in accordance with practicality. What you consider to be practicality. Now, if, you, if one of your A's is be a microbiologist and you've never studied it, that might be low on practicality. So it might be A9. So yet, yet writing for an international da, 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 might be high on practicality because you're a journalism major or you're a business communications major. Okay, now you've got set skill. Listen to what you've got. You've got four variables. You've got skill, interest, satisfaction, practicality. You have a list of A1 through whatever, B1 through whatever, C1 through whatever. Start with A1, this is the final variable, and ask yourself the following question. Would I be willing to do what's necessary to get this job? That might be go back to school for six months. It might be make 25 phone calls. It might be whatever, travel to Dubuque. I don't know, whatever it is. If the answer is no, cross it out. Period. It's, that's it. You know, go down the list from A1 to whatever you can say, well, I'd be willing to do what's necessary to get that job. No, cross it out. Yes, leave it on. Having done that, you will have a list of probably anywhere from 3 to 15 or 3 to 8 job targets that have taken five personal variables. Now look, at any point along the line, you can go backwards. If, those, if you don't like those, you go back and change your, pick another, another numbers from your list of 25 and do another grid, or invent new jobs, or rank them differently. So you have an ongoing process at which any time in your life, I know people that use this process continually, any time in your life you can take a look into who you are and create job targets out of your skills and out of your interests. Very, very valuable, because once you have the job target, you see, that's, that's half of the battle at least. With a job target, you can then apply energy. See, those of you who are practical, mechanical minded know that if you don't have a point source, if you put energy, it, goes, it disappears. If you have a direction, it makes movement. So with a job target, you can then do all the things that are necessary, and you're on the path to the job. You live on getting what it is that you created out of your idea of skills and interests. Okay, so that's the thing about job targets. And, it's, and that's reprinted, most of it. You know, not all the extra verbiage I put in. Okay, now that you have job targets, what you need to know is this that it is not the best qualified people who get the best jobs, it's those who are most skilled in job finding. That is the way it is. See, Mary Ann, please. See, Mary Ann might be the greatest graphic designer or whatever ever to come out of school here. See, what Mary Ann does is say, I am so terrific, I mean, I just blew them all away with my illustrations, I've done all this stuff, I'm gonna wait for, for somebody to come and offer me a job. She's gonna wait for an opportunity to knock. See, opportunity does not knock. <laughs> she wait a long time. See, she, she's got the skills, and she's waiting for the job to come along. You see, what's your name? Rich, on the other hand, is a kind of a mediocre student, but pretty interested in graphic design, did pretty well. But he got hit to how to find out how the job market works. And what Rich did is he discovered that I had this little company in Milwaukee that produces, and he's also, by the way, a great water sport fan. And so he you knew that I had this little company on the lake in Milwaukee, and we produced water sport equipment. He said, aha. He said, and he found that out. I never advertised, but he did some research. 
And he said, I'm going to go and put my graphic design work right in touch with that war sport equipment so that they can improve their war sport equipment. So he ferrets me out. He gets on the phone to me and says, hi, my name is Rich, and I have a, uh, a real background in war sports. I know that you've introduced a new line of war skis, and I've got some ideas how I can put some graphic design on those war skis that will really improve their visibility in the marketplace. I'd like to show you how to do that. See, he would be in there in a minute to see me. See, I couldn't resist something like that. You see, so Rich would be there communicating away from my job, my life to work better, my company to work better. Rich would be here getting the job Marianne wouldn't, because Marianne's waiting for an opportunity to knock. You see, it is literally the delivery system. You see, what we have here is payload. What we've got is $35,000 worth of payloads, courses, books, education, facts, data, information, more facts, processes, all of that stuff. And what's been dropped out by and large, except for the effort, we have a strong effort here on campus, but generally over our career, what's been dropped out is the delivery system. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to make it work? Getting the skills of the delivery system, how to make it work in the world, will, it, will take you know, a Mary Ann type student and expand her incredibly. I mean, with good grades and good skills, plus the understanding of the system, it's just dynamite. You go anywhere you want. And even with mediocre skills and a good understanding of the system, you can literally find jobs in the way else you've heard of. So you've got to know that that's the thing that is showing up more and more and more. The people who get jobs never were trained in them. People in really top-notch jobs never managed in that field, but they knew how to contact the people and how to communicate and do the things that we're going to show you in a few minutes. Okay. We now we started with the context of satisfaction. We looked at why we're here. We looked at the, the purpose of the evening. We looked at the work experience as being a life experience. We examined the uh, fantasy jobs, the kind of environments that we want to work in. We looked at a process to identify skills and interests and job targets. We moved from there into the idea of getting a system together. Now we want to move to the next stage, which is the essential universal hiring rule. And it's how to get hired. And the universal hiring rule is this, and this is not written down. The universal hiring rule is this. Any employer will hire any individual so long as the employer is convinced it will bring more value than it costs. To any employer, I don't care if it's 87% unemployment, any employer will hire any individual so long as the employer is convinced that it will bring him more value than it costs. If Rich shows me that he can bring me an extra $10,000 a month in sales, I'm delighted to pay him $2,000 a month. See, I'm delighted because he came to me with, here's what I can do to increase your sales. See, the problem is that the way most of you look for jobs is, if you're not looking for a job, you have anything? <laughs> you know, it's like how it ends. Where, you know, it's, what you're dramatizing is the needs. The way to identify a job is this. You first identify your job target. You look into your job target area. Let's say in Rich's case, his job target is water sports, like that. He looks into the field of water sports. He identifies graphic design as applying to water sports as a problem, benefit that he can communicate. And he communicates to the person that has that. As you look for a problem, and you find out who, that you can solve, and you find out who would, who would benefit by your solving that problem. Basic. One out of ten will do it. It's basic. If you get nothing else out of that tonight, it can transform your ability to communicate about work. What you communicate is benefit, not need. You guys all communicate need. You're all from down, no, I want a job, I need something. No, 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 no. See, you're not communicating benefit. What employers tell me time after time after time, he says, send me some people, let me know about some people who know what we want. Over here. You know, I don't care about what you want. I want to know what works for me over here. See, so you've got to move off that. You've got to determine the thing that you can communicate and contribute. Then you can go anywhere. People love to be supported. Except there's a little catch in it. Because the final part of it is you have to communicate. And if, when it comes to communication, none of us make it. See, we do, literally do not know how to communicate. Just 
for openers. Who's got some ideas about what communication, what is communication? Just some ideas about what communication is, what it includes, like that. What's communication? Yes? Pardon? Talking and listening. Good, thank you. What else? What else? Yes. An understanding reach between two or more people. Great, thank you. What else? Some other inputs towards the definition of communication. Yes. Clearly saying what you mean. Clearly saying what you mean. Okay, good. Great. What else? Exchanging ideas. Exchanging ideas. Okay, great. Towards it. What else? What are some other descriptions, definitions, inputs? Yes. Transmitting information. Transmitting information. Okay, good. What else? Sending, yes. Sending and receiving messages. Good. Sending and receiving messages. Great. Good. Thank you. What else? Any other inputs towards communication, towards the description? Did you hear that? <coughs> Any, anything else about it? Anybody have something that they didn't see was covered? Okay, I'm going to tell you what communication is for the purpose of this evening, and you can write this down, and I want you to look at this beyond this evening. Communication is being responsible to ensure that a message is received. Communication is being responsible, underline responsible, to ensure that a message is received. Communication is being responsible to ensure that a message is received. Now, for received, you can put parentheses and put recreated. Another word for receive. See, the key word is responsibility. See, communication is will, being willing to be responsible to ensure, responsible to ensure that a message is received. I'll show you what I mean by that. Mary, would you just fall asleep? Because you're almost there anyway, so just let it go my ball all out. Good. Let's just close your eyes. Good. But Mary just fell asleep, okay? It's not an uncommon occurrence in the crowd inside. And I'm saying, well, communication is being responsible to ensure that a message is received. And I notice that some people are writing it down, some people are nodding, some people are not, you know. And I notice that Mary is sleeping. So I kind of put it out again. I say, well, communication is being responsible to ensure that a message is received. And I notice that she's still sleeping. Now I have an option. At that point, I say, great, that's her problem. I'm going to move on with the lecture. Let's just go into the next thing. Or, see, or I can go over to Mary and say, Mary, wake up. Good. <laughs> you hear? Good. Communication is being responsible to ensure that a message is received. Did you get that? Great, thank you. I can get it received. See, what most of us do in communication is we talk and then we quickly blame the other person because they didn't get it. See, most of all, they're too stupid to get it. They never understand that stuff. You know, they're not willing to listen to He never hears me. I've told her a thousand times and she never listens. See, it's always out there where the responsibility is. Get this, this can transform the way you communicate. Communication is being responsible to ensure. Now that may mean you have to wake a few people up. It may mean you have to go running around the, the block six times to get to the person. But coming from responsibility, you will communicate. Coming from, oh, well, I, you know, I put it out there, how do I know, you know, uh -huh, uh -huh, they'll get it or it won't, it's their fault anyway, they're too stupid. See, you won't communicate. And what most people do in this world is they've got it set up so that they will blame others for not, they're not having to be able to communicate. See, I want to let you know that I'm responsible tonight to communicate. Totally my responsibility to get there, everybody here to get what I have to say. That doesn't mean I'm going to do it. But I'm not, that's my, so if I don't do it, what I don't get to do is to blame you. Oh, well, it's Iowa. I mean, after all, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, see, I don't get to do that. See, what I get to do is to say, Jesus, now how can I clean up my communication for the next level? See, I, I reached about two-thirds of the way back this time. You know, how can I get to the very back row? See, coming from responsibility, I get to do what's necessary to communicate. Coming from, well, it's Iowa, blah, 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 I get to not do anything, right? 